to my shop. My name is Richard Fry, and I'm here to try to convince you that power carving is the way to go. Um, I, I like to use an analogy. If you went out in your backyard and you wanted to dig a swimming pool, you could go out there with a tablespoon and a bucket and start in digging a hole. Or you could get yourself a big uh, backhoe and dig the hole. And that's kind of the way I look at carving. Uh, the knives are very traditional and very nice and they can do just as good. But the power carving does it a little faster and I like to do it fast. So I want to give you a few opinions of mine and that doesn't mean that yours can't differ, but uh, I want to tell, take you through the different types of carving and show you a little bit about why I like to power carve. For a beginner who's never carved before, I don't like to see them invest a lot of money and then be disappointed. I like to see them go in at an inexpensive level to begin with and try it out and then if they really enjoy it and they take to it which I'm sure most of them will uh, then they can move up in thing so a beginner would start with this type of a power carver this this it, the brand doesn't matter but this is most usually associated with a Dremel this one isn't but um, it it's big it's heavy it's loud it's slow, um, but it'll get the job done. And it's exactly what I used to carve my first bird. So um, I, I don't disagree with this is a good place to start. Then if you enjoy it, which I did immensely, usually the, in your second or third bird, you're gonna wanna move up to something a little bigger. And some people as an intermediate step will move up to a Fordham type carver now this particular one is a table model it sits on a table most of them have a hook on it and they hang it from a, a piece and use it that way it has more power uh, it has an adjustable speed as does the first one uh, it is a little more easily controlled than than the dremel type but it's still um, burdens you with a heavy flexible uh, line here that that makes it a little cumbersome when you're really getting into the detailed work um, so this is a good intermediate step then if you um, want to move up to the to the really good steps you will go to something that has a little DC motor like this and a, just in a little flimsy electrical wire and these are adjustable at different speeds usually up to about 40,000 RPM and uh, they take two different size shafts in their collets usually a 332nd or a 1 8th and when you're buying uh, your burrs and your cutting burrs, I recommend that you buy 1 8 shafts. There's no advantage in having a 3 32nd shaft. It's just weaker. And I've had a couple after 25 or 30 years uh, where the tops have broke off because the shaft was smaller in diameter than, than the entire one. But after using it that long, I had got my wear out of it. So um, these type of power carvers are on the market today from a range of about 200 all the way up to $1,000 each. And the difference is this. If you get one at the $200 range, it's not going to have the power that the more expensive ones have and if you aren't careful if you buy a less expensive one they'll work but you just don't really push into your work a lot and put a lot of pressure on it 
because you'll overload the motor and you'll have a, a, a problem and you'll have to send it into the shop for repairs and that's expensive and some of the less, exp less expensive models have been known, people have been known to have their motors in the shop for repair as much as they have them home for use. Um, so I don't expect a lot of people to go out and buy this particular uh, brand. Uh, it's one that I bought originally because it was made originally for the tool and die industry working on steel. So it's got a lot of power. And I've had it for uh, 40 years, close to. And uh, the only time it's ever went into the shop was the collets wore out and I needed to get a new set of collets. So um, it has been very good for me. Uh, one of the things that you need to know when you're using a power tool is what types of burrs do you want? There are several different types of burrs. With a Dremel uh, tool, usually they give you two or three types of burrs when you buy the thing. And it's a single cut spiral burr. And I think they're worthless. You can take them and you work on wood and they don't cut real fast and they jump all around and they get dull quick. And it, do I need any more? negatives to convince you that Dremel tools are not the way you want to buy any extra ones of. Uh, the next best thing in the sp is a double spiral. This is called a double spiral. I don't know if we can pick it up, but it has two different directions and they cut a little better, but I still don't like them. I've tried them. Uh, I don't care for them. What I recommend is this. We have a type, and this is an exaggerated one because I used it in a different uh, grinder that I'm going to tell you about in a little bit. They look like uh, porcupine quills sticking straight up, and they're carbide coated, and they're called the, one of the brands. There are several brands that make these, but the brand that started and the, probably the one that's most frequently found out there, it's called a cuts all. K-U-T-Z-A-L-L, cuts all. And uh, this is something that's very aggressive. It moves a lot of wood with a little power. And when you get done, you have something that's rough shaped. Then after you get done with a cut saw, you can move to a diamond cutter this is one that's a diamond cutter. It has small flakes of diamond embedded, and this will, will move it as smooth as if you were sanding it. And as you can see by my little tray here, I've got lots of different uh, shapes and varieties that I've used, and you don't need any more than two or three. Um, one that looks like a cylinder, one that looks like a teardrop will cover 98% of the carving that you do. Um, diamonds can be bought in catalogs in uh, quantities of little boxes like this for $20 a box or less. And they have fine grit and they have medium grit and they have large grit. The large grit will cut a little faster uh, and leave a little rougher surface. The fine grit will smooth up the surface and be better for real fine detail when you get to the point where you're going to want to be doing real fine detail. Um, neither one of those sets have the same quality of diamonds as the ones that they sell individually. The ones that they sell individually are usually $10, $12, $15 a piece, and they're the amount of diamond chips that are impregnated in that head is about five to 10 times as much as it is in the cheaper sets. 
but the cheaper sets will work to get started and that's what you need to try before you go invest in a lot of money okay the last cutter that I haven't told you about yet is a hand grinder um, there are various different models and makes I have several that I use here at home um, this one came from Harbor Freight and cost like 10 or 12 dollars and it works uh, I have a cuts all cutter in it that costs twice as much as the grinder um, but the advantage of this is speed I have affectionately nicknamed these as the hog and when I uh, carve with fellow carvers and sometimes I pick it up and they say show me how I do it and I give them one of these <coughs> they, um, they they're a little startled okay and I'm going to show you in a little bit how effective these are but first I want to continue to talk about a few of the things before we actually start carving can you perceive that everything that's in this area that I'm marking with an X is waste material that's got to go if you started with the Dremel or the Fordham or even your more expensive power tool and did it that way it would take a little while but I'm going to show you how fast the hog does it this is my homemade air air filter or dust collector whatever you want to call it I've got a little squirrel cage fan behind some car air cleaners and it works just fine for me you might want to turn your sound down because I'll be making a little noise Now you can see how I've went down from the top to the top of this line that I scribed on here and I went in as deep as the line that I had put on the top and I took those directly off the pattern the pattern tells me how to do that the next thing I'm going to do is put in a little groove for the for the uh, cape feather <laughs> Now if you have decided which way you want your head to turn, if you want to turn it at all, a lot of times they'll take the heads and they'll put them straight on. They look a little nicer if you turn them a little bit, one way or the other way. Uh, whichever way you turn it, it's important for the wing, if you turn it, let's say we're going to turn it to the clockwise to the right like this then the wing on the right side should be the top wing in its fixed position when we're done because it shows a little better and and people like it more that way so uh, I'm going to sketch in where the wing the wing goes under these side pocket feathers on a real bird it they actually can take and spread their side pocket like this and they fold up their wing and they put it underneath and then they collapse those feathers back on top and that helps keep their wings uh, waterproof. So uh, after they get through preening, they'll put them in there and they'll go in right about at this point here and they'll come back about this far and that'll be a straight edge and it'll be tilted down a little bit. Then the rest of the wing is going to come in like this and your scapular feathers are going to come in like this so uh, I'm going to make that adjustment on here the other wing is going to go under that and it's going to be basically like this with with the scapulas in that side so that you can see 
So now we're going to do just a little bit of quick alterations here. You see, I've just taken away some of the excess around the tip of that one wing. Now I'm going to go in and lower it. I'm lowering it because it has to be under this wing and this wing has to tilt down. When, it, when that wing goes into the side pocket, it fits along the body like this, so it's at this angle. It's not straight out like this or up like this. Um, now we're going to just rough shape this side of the duck a little bit to show you what we do. We start here and our high point on, on the back and the sides are going to be represented by this line. This dotted line is going to be the high point and it comes about like this. Okay? We don't take a lot here. You can see by the dust trail on the dust going into the filters that it's very important to either have an air filter catching your dust and sucking the air that way or wear a mask because you don't need to inhale a half a ton of sawdust every time you go down and work in your shop. <laughs> that I have now rough shaped pretty much the right hand side of the duck with the exception of the tail which I usually leave till about last but it, they have a little rump that comes like this in this area and then the tail feathers will come from here and they'll come up like this and back over the other side like that with a curve like that and I'm not going to continue just showing you how the hog works I'm going to show you one that I have went ahead with the hog and completed on both sides with the little rump and the, I leave plenty of tail feather there so I'm not breaking it off till I get down to the end and that gives you an idea they got a rump on the rounded rump underneath also but that gives you an idea and then the head is very similar you start out with your you start out with your band sawed head like this and you can have a alert head that's up high or you can have a lower head that's more at rest and following the patterns you can look at it and you can see that it's got an eye channel here and the top head of the top portion of the head is smaller in diameter than the bottom and you just work around it and I strongly encourage you to invest in a study bill. That's a plastic or a plaster of Paris mold that's made off of an original uh, bird that, that gives you the shape of this so that you can get that because it's very important to the species of the bird that you're doing that you get the bill exactly right. That's the, be getting the bill right and setting the eyes properly are the two things that the judges just are not forgiving on. If you don't have them right, they're not going to like your bird at all. And um, it really shows up if you've got them done well. But this is just a, a rough shaped head that would sit on here. On this one, I put the top wing the other way, so we have to turn the head the other way. But this is kind of the way it ends up at that point. Now you're ready at this juncture to switch from the hog into the NSK or other brand power turner and get a, this is the teardrop shape that I was telling you about is one of the two that I use the very most. And you can define and, and enlarge your pattern and get it much smoother. You can get it to the point where you're ready to start laying out your pattern 
of your feathers and work your feathers in. One other way of doing that with the power is, is what I like to use is my Fordham with a cylindrical disc that you can wrap two inch uh, strips of sanding paper around and use that as a sander and let, I have to turn the speed down because you don't want to sand at a fast but you see when I start here with the sander in no time I've got this side pocket ready to actually start laying out pegs. Now I don't have the right contour on this one. I have to go in and this is very high in here and I left it that way because I don't know until I get the head matched up and the neck work down. I don't know just how much to take away from here. That'll happen later on. Uh, I'm not trying to explain to you the full physique or anatomy of a duck right now. Uh, I have a group of people and we do work on those kind of things together and, and you're more than welcome to contact anybody in the Woodland Woodworkers or myself and, and find out and uh, join us there. But I'm trying to take today to show you the techniques that are used in carving and the equipment that's used so that you'll know a little bit about whether you'd enjoy it or not. Um, after we get it smooth like this, we lay out the feathers. And then we may individually carve some to where they stand up and stand out. There's usually about three and a half rows of feathers from the top that show uh, when you're doing this and you don't want them all in the same line. Um, I'm rushing this so it looks it. But anyway, you keep laying them out like this, then you can go back in with your NSK or your whatever brand you so choose. Um, if you, and I take a, uh, little stone. There it is. Sometimes my box and my fingers are not compatible. But I'll take, and when I see the feathers like this, I will go in with a little stone and I'm going to texture in little splits in the feathers. Those splits later on when you're doing the wood burning can be accentuated and they can really add to the life appeal of the There are two types of decoys that a lot of people carve. The first type and the easiest type is called the hunting decoys. And they're always smooth on a side. Uh, you wouldn't be putting in this detail that I'm doing now. You'd paint it in. And from start to finish, uh, your time investment might be 40 hours if you had things like this. Um, if you go into a little more detailed one, uh, you can easily spend a couple hundred hours. And this is one of my decorative floating decoys that um, I would use in a contest if I were still competing. Um, I don't know how much of the camera can pick up on the thing, but you see the little indentations and all those, those are the 
details that I was putting in with the little grinder and the stone, and then you accentuate them when you wood burn each of those lines. I would burn typically around 60 lines to the inch. Um, the birds are, I carve full body for when I carve for competition versus the flat bottom that they use for the hunting decoys. The full body requires you to carve uh, feet and insert those. You can see how fine the tail feathers get. You see how I told you I like the top feather or the top wing to point parallel to the same way that the head is. If this is pointing this way, this is the wing that goes on top. It looks a little better than if it were the other way around. Um, I do band all my birds. That's where I put my um, name and serial numbers on them. Uh, you can see that painting gets the iridescence colors in this particular. This is the same species that this bird here is from. When you get done, this, this, this could look like this with the exception of the fact that it's flat on the bottom. And the bills are very close to those study bills, including the hole all the way through the nostril. And the eyes must be set exactly right. The eyes are always tilted a little bit forward and a little bit down. And they have to be able to see with the center of their eye, the tip of their bill. They can't find their food if they don't. This is a buffle head drake. The hen is a brown, um, slightly smaller, but very subdued. They call these butterballs, and you'll find them on rivers and lakes late in the season, very commonly around here. Painting is the challenge. Painting I do in acrylics. Some people can do it in oils. Uh, the very best carver in the world, in my opinion, is Jet Bernay down in Louisiana, and he does all of his in oils, and when he gets done, they look exactly like a live bird. Uh, Pat Godden is the second best carver in the world, as far as I'm concerned. He's over in Ontario, and he does all of his paintings in acrylics. So when I paint in acrylics, I paint many layers on the same feather, and each layer is slightly different in color, and I mix them. And I put them on, so and, and they're so thin you can actually see through them into the others. And I, typically, before I get done, any of my uh, paintings have got 8 to 12 coats of paint before before I'm, I'm satisfied and, and completed. But uh, I think if you put that next to a mounted bird, an actual bird, you'd see that they were quite similar. Thank you for coming to my shop.